Hello, welcome back to the YouTube channel of Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. This is another church in Worcestershire. And this is the church, originally the chapel of St. Kenelm in Ronsley. Originally, it's, uh, well, originally the settlement associated with it was gathered around the church. Ronsley is a relatively modern village down in the valley. The old village was Kenelmstow, and it is named, of course, for St. Kenelm, St. Kenelm of Winchcombe, that's where he's buried, or was buried, was an Anglo-Saxon boy king. In the early 9th century, he becomes king of Mercia. That's this part of England. And according to the stories, this pious young lad is murdered by his older sister. His older sister believes that because he's just seven years old at the time, if she does away with him, then she can, in some way, elevate herself to at least having her husband being the king for her. At the time, and indeed, really, not in, it's not until Queen Elizabeth I, in the latter part of the 16th century, that England really gets used to the idea that a woman can be a jolly good monarch in her own right. Before then, you have this idea that a monarch, a, a queen regnant, is a very bad thing. And, of course, the, her, the previous queen, Queen Mary I, is a good sign of this. But St. Kenelm then is murdered. According to legend, his, uh, well, there's a vision of him at Rome, and the investigators are sent to find out what's happened to the king. And... His sister is there in her church, and she is interviewed, and she says, well, if I had anything to do with his death, may my eyes fall from my sockets. And, of course, this being medieval legend, forthwith her eyes fell from her sockets. They enjoyed that kind of thing. Well, precisely what the details of what actually happened to Ken Helm are have been so overlaid with legend that we, we're not really sure. But what we do know is that he was a boy king, and that he was regarded as having been murdered probably by either his elder sister or her husband. He is then buried at Winchcombe, and because he's regarded as a saint, this becomes a centre of pilgrimage. And along the pilgrim routes, there are churches and chapels built dedicated to St. Kenelm, and this is one of them. This is a building of the... well largely, it would appear, of the 14th, 15th century. Older origins, undoubtedly, the Kenel pilgrimage becomes a big thing in the Anglo-Saxon period. Winchcombe Abbey is incredibly important. There's nothing left of it now. But it's incredibly important in its day. And therefore, yes, you, you have these churches and chapels. And this was a chapel. Now, what does it mean to say that a medieval church is a chapel? There are some people who think it's about size. It's not. This is considerably bigger than several parish churches. But it's called a, a chapel because it doesn't have a parish. Rather, it's a dependency, it's a chapelry of another church. I suspect here it was probably Clent. And it's not until really the 19th century that it becomes a, a church on its own, with its own vicar. And then, of course, not for very long because... In the latter part of the 20th century, you have the decline in various ways. You've got fewer men training for the ministry. You've got smaller congregations, less money, various ways. And so, very quickly, you get places like this. They tend to become effectively chapelries again. So, chapels got nothing to do with size. The, the biggest chapels, Anglican chapels in England, are very, very big. But this is a really sort of size you'd expect of a, an ordinary parish church. Certainly in this kind of area, we're still up in the Clent Hills. So we'll have a look around here and make some comment on St. Ken Elms, the chapel that's become a parish church. As usual, then, we start at the west end, looking east. There is no chancel here. That is 
a feature that you sometimes you quite often find in medieval chapels that there's no separate chancel because the way that they were run was different. Now, sometimes there are separate chancels, but here, quite typically, there, there isn't. Um, we have here at the back a an old watercolour. Let's try and get that. So that is what the interior looked like in 1845. And you can see there you've got effectively a, a three-decker pulpit. You've got a big Jacobean pulpit with a reading desk below, and you've got box pews. And all that's taken out after... 1845 and replaced with the current much more Victorian interior. Um, now, Ken Elmstow has a, a further connection with St. Ken Elm in that here it is, uh, according to the legend anyway, Ken Elm's sister, and just to make sure I get her name right, um, Quendrida. She and her husband, who also is um, Ken Elm's guardian, they conspire here at what becomes called Ken Elmstow, obviously not called that at the time, to murder the lad. You can see here you, these uh, corbels. I'm not sure what they, rep what they represent. I don't think they would have been a... certainly not a rude bean there. Nice roof up there. And they say so they... But clearly they yeah, supported something or some things. Um, there we have the War Memorial. Nice big, actually, that's a Norman doorway, so that tells us that, as we would expect, the Anglo-Saxon church is rebuilt in the 12th century. Font is relatively modern. Again, we'd expect that. It's only a small building. But also, because it's a chapel, it may not have had the right for baptism. People might not have been allowed to baptize here. Um, it only became a parish church in 1866, so that it may not have had, say, the right of baptism. We've got here some very nice, this is by Edward Byrne Jones' window. You can just, uh, the camera's not very good at catching stained glass windows, but this is by Edward Byrne Jones, and it's uh, 1880s, Peace and Faith. So, nice pre Raphaelite window there. We've got here this window here represent or tells the story of um, St. Ken Elm. At the top we've got him, he has a dream, a premonition of his death, and the dream has him in a tree, and he's then cut down, and we then see him being murdered, and he's buried at Winchcombe. And then the vision that he is there, and he become and the, the expedition from Rome comes, and they find his, his uh, burial place, and a, a sacred spring bursts forth. The window is dedicated to the child victims of the Great War, which is, of course, quite fitting, given you've got this little boy, St. Ken Elm, seven, only seven years old when he's murdered. Um, pulpit, of course, is Victorian, all to do with the church, with his becoming a parish church. And then you've got... Uh, Reredos of the, the Last Supper, not after Leonardo, so we've got uh, four of the apostles on this side of the um, table. Now, it's always interesting with the Last Supper whether the artist decides to depict Judas or not. And here the artist has decided to have Judas present. And we don't know, you see, was Judas at the Last Supper or not? And different people give different answers. But here he's shown, you can see Judas in the middle opposite Peter, and Judas has the money bag, which indicates that. And then you've got um, John leaning on Jesus' shoulder. And again, a point to do with the way the artistic conventions work. John, because he's reputed to have died in you know, around about 100 AD, um, and, he, uh, and because John is reputed to have died at a, a very... Uh, such a remove from the events of 30-odd 30, A.D., 30, 33 A.D., when Christ was crucified, then it's reckoned that he must have been quite young at the time, so he's pictured always as this teenager, which has led to some very silly things happening. Famously, of course, Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code, but he's following people who say, well, look, you've got this long-haired figure next to... Uh, this long-haired, rather, uh, somewhat... Um, feminine-looking figure next to Christ in Leonardo's Last Supper. Well, the whole point is that it's 
depicting him as a, a young teenager. And then here we have apostles, and again, you've got John here, and John is depicted carry well, he's, he's got his, his um, cup, and again, he's a young man without a beard. So that's just artistic convention, shall we say. And here we have, look at this, medieval wall painting. And um, there's this uh, young man, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, West End, you've got a gallery there, uh, which is now where the organ sits, and obviously access limited for obvious reasons, because a lot of places they don't like people going up there in case of an accident. Reading desk there, and straight down the middle. St. Kenelm's, you can see the banner there, with St. Kenelm on it, because this is, after all, St. Kenelm's Church. And in this very area, so it is said, close to this very site, his murder was planned by his uh, sister, Quendrida, and her husband, stroke lover, depending on which version of the story you listen to. Um, obviously, they change every time. So that's the inside at St. Ken Elm's Chapel. And so here we are outside of St. Ken Elm's. You can see that it's a lovely little tower you've got here, sort of turret, but very 15th century, very um, ornamented at the top. And we'll obviously see the bottom when we go round that end. And then behind me, you've got the porch, which looks to be maybe 16th, 17th century. And that shelters a Norman doorway. So this is where, I say, according to the legend, St. Ken Elm's murder was plotted. He was King of Mercia, although, of course, at his age, he wouldn't have actually been ruling. He had a regent, he'd have a regent doing that, because you don't want a seven-year-old boy governing the country. However pious and sensible and mature he may be, he's still only seven. Um, so we'll have a look around, and as I've been looking for a an opportunity to say something about the legend of St. Ken Elm, and eventually found a church, a nice little chapel like this, where you can share something of the legend and not extend the video too long beyond the tour of the church. Um, so let's have a look around the outside, shall we? And so this is the path that leads from the, the road to the church, although it's not the one that leads from the car park. You can see the tower is a different stone from most of the rest of the building. You can also see the building being extended and altered over time. The westernmost section appears to be the oldest. You can just see one of these pilasters there, which is very common um, in 12th century architecture. Um, windows have all been altered, of course, and here on the um, at the east, you can see that clearly there was something there. I do wonder if it was some kind of shrine or something, and that's why it's demolished. Um, because clearly there's an opening that's been filled in. And what what would uh, they have done that with here? And I think the obvious answer is a shrine. Because that would have been seen at the Reformation as... Uh, Popish, superstitious, and of course you don't want anything to do with things that are popish and superstitious at the Reformation. They were swept away in so many places, and as we saw that old picture, the interior was very Protestantized at one point. It's a very nice wooden um, front of the porch. I mean, the whole thing probably would have been wooden originally, um, but the sides, they look like the sides probably rotted, and they've replaced them in brick. But you've still got this nice, nice carving and this big solid doorway here and we'll just open the doorway to have a look at that Norman um, there we are you see you've got Christ in majesty look at that tympanum what a marvelous tympanum and those dragons those interlaced serpents over the top and these beak heads I mean because it's a small building but that doorway screams this is a really high status structure this is really important. It's not just uh, here for some peasants to worship in. It's here for, for the pilgrims. And soft red sandstone, quite common. Um, that's obviously, that's part of the... Not so how far does the Norman church extend? 
that bobs all the way here. Um, and here's this blocked arch opening here. And that is uh, a bit careful here, it's a bit muddy and obviously I don't want to slip over because that will seriously spoil my day and probably several, well many days following. But we do have to go around here for a number of reasons, one of which is you've got the, there's a crypt, which is quite common for this kind of location. It's uh, used, I think, for storage and stuff now, but originally it would have been part, hello, hello, <laughs> originally it would have been part of the, um, because it's a yeah, pilgrim church, you'd have had people go down in there and there would have been perhaps a shrine or something. It's very, very common back in the day, so obviously it's being, being used at the moment, they're taking things in and out of it. Um, and we won't go down there, it's a bit muddy and therefore slippery. And slippery does not work with my um, um, well, particularly my elbow. And um, here we've got this, and look at that, they're, those aren't gargoyles, they're grotesques, but aren't they wonderful? That carving, really high status building in spite of its size. Um, and I said, because it is a pilgrim church, they would have um, a niche where they would have had a statue. And then here, under the archway, that might have been a west door at one point, it's not anymore. Ancient yew trees, again, because this has been a church here since Anglo-Saxon times. And this lovely, you can see the block north door there, Rather nice, an unusual insect that will just you know, make you wonder about dates and things. When has this been altered? When has this reached its current state? So that, that towered again. So that is St. Kenelm's, um, Kenelmstow, and of course now it's Romsley Parish Church. But there's, so the village isn't isn't here because Ken Elmstow disappeared so you've just got a farmhouse there and a quite an extensive graveyard now because it's uh, used for burials but one suspects that in the Middle Ages it wouldn't have been because again it's a chapel rather than a parish church. So there you have it, St Ken Elms, Romsley the chapel commemorating the martyr boy king of Mercia. Well, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video, enjoyed coming out here to the beautiful Clent Hills in Worcestershire to enjoy the atmosphere and to see this very special little medieval chapel. So thank you for watching, and may God bless you and keep you until next time.